This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. The first day of President Bush's version of a new war on drugs. It started off with a political attack by the president against political opponents. Mr. Bush accused Democrats in Congress of playing party politics. They said that he is being unrealistic in trying to sell an anti-drug strategy that isn't new, isn't enough, and he doesn't say how he's going to pay for it. In Colombia, the reaction from the cocaine cartel narco criminals was fast and furious. Correspondent Mark Phillips is in Colombia and begins our coverage. The cartel's answer to President Bush's speech was immediate and predictably bloody. A bomb went off in a Medellin restaurant while the president was still speaking, part of the cartel's relentless campaign of mass terror. They want to really hit the good people. They don't like the good people. Among the good people hit were two American journalists who work for the Miami-based Spanish-language news network Univision. The drug lords are becoming increasingly angry at the spotlight of world attention being focused on them. Colombians tuned into the president's speech carried on TV here, wondering what amount of help they'd be getting. The newspaper headlines screamed, Bush enters the war. The politicians, like Cesar Gaviria, still trying to carry on a presidential campaign in the midst of this battle, welcome the money being offered, but wanted more. The government liked the idea of fighting demand in the U.S. as well. If we in Colombia fight the drugs baron, and the consumption uh, continues in the United States or in the, or in the developed countries, we are not going to win this war. Crucial to keeping up the momentum of the government's anti-drug war is the extradition to the U.S. of Eduardo Martinez Romero. But that extradition, thought to be imminent, is still being delayed as his appeal is considered. We are uh, in the obligation of study what has he to say uh, in order to defend himself. Yet some here feel the government is delaying out of fear of more cartel violence, of raising tensions already near the breaking point. Maybe they will kill me. But we cannot live in a world like this. We prefer to die. According to U.S. officials here, the anti-cartel crackdown is having an effect. Drug shipments to the U.S. are being disrupted. But that has not yet cut down on the supply of cocaine on American streets. The cartels have vast supplies of the drug at transshipment points in the Caribbean and in the U.S. itself. Mark Phillips, CBS News, Bogota. Honduran billionaire Juan Ramon Mata Ballesteros was convicted in Los Angeles today on cocaine dealing charges. U.S. officials say Mata oversaw the smuggling of tons of cocaine from Colombia to California. Mata's capture and extradition from Honduras last year sparked days of anti-American rioting there, including the burning of the U.S. Embassy Annex. In Washington, President Bush began trying to sell his strategy for fighting the drug plague with fighting words against critics in Congress and with a high publicity visit to a hospital. White House correspondent Leslie Stahl begins our coverage of the president, the Congress, the drug war, and party politics. His drug crisis by visiting a public hospital today where these babies, ready for adoption, are particularly hard to place. <laughs> Mr. Bush's campaign for his new drug war started on a defensive note. He called the widespread criticism nothing but carping from the Democrats. And people would stop just criticizing for partisan reasons and get behind the program. And then if there's something additional we can be doing, let's do it. But the president took his own partisan swipes, bludgeoning the Democrats with one of his favorite weapons. Every time you make a proposal, you have somebody jump up and say, raise taxes. So I am not in a mode to raise taxes. And he defended the increased penalties he's proposing for casual users, denial of housing and college loans, revoking of driver's licenses. Uh, I don't think it's fair to go after the street hood and uh, let the casual university hip user uh, think that he's doing no damage to society. Because the plan would give law enforcement 70% of the funds, the ACLU called the proposal a political hoax. This is a country that cannot provide treatment and rehabilitation for people who are lining up at hospitals to get it. And he is proposing to try to incarcerate people whom he cannot find and cannot catch. There is some evidence that the get tough approach is working. Customs officials in Florida say the supply of cocaine from Colombia has virtually dried up in the last month. Everything, money laundering, uh, drug smuggling, I won't say all of it, but 90% of it just 
came to a standstill, because you have to realize all of it is controlled by the cartel. Officials here can see that the president's first televised speech was not his best performance, and that selling his drug plan will take a lot of hard campaigning around the country and on Capitol Hill. Leslie Stahl, CBS News, the White House. As the battle to combat drugs continued in the streets last night, Congress reconvened in a mood to battle the president, saying his drug plan is too little too late. If you want more prisons and you, want, and you need more prosecutors and judges, and if you want more policemen, all of these things cost money. The president's defenders, of course, did their best to play down that kind of talk. We're not going to excite the American people arguing about where we're going to find the money. They want us to find it, and they want us to fund the drug program. It's not just finding the money to fight drugs, but finding the money for everything on the congressional agenda this year and doing it without raising taxes. These angry senior citizens all but attacked Dan Rostenkowski, the powerful chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, when he returned to his Chicago district during the recess. Why? Because they want catastrophic health care insurance, but don't like the surtax Congress tacked on them to pay for it. Budget constraints dominate all policy decisions. It's a fact of life with which we must live and with which we must deal. But what it means is that we must establish priorities. Republicans take the line the drug program could be the catalyst to do just that. For the first time, uh, some of these nutty programs that we keep funding will bump up against uh, a priority that cannot be dismissed. But Congress must deal with more than just nutty programs. Defense, the environment, whether or not to cut the capital gains tax. In one way or another, they are just some of the issues Congress must come to grips with this year. And I think there's a comfortable, unfortunate sort of fooling ourselves that goes on these days when people think we can sort of do everything without, without cost. During the Reagan years, there were a lot of warnings about how deficit spending would result in our mortgaging the future. But as this Congress finds it harder and harder to finance everything from the drug war to aid to Poland, it may conclude the future's arrived. Bob Schieffer, CBS News at the Capitol. And still to come on tonight's CBS Evening News, Jerry Bowen on the deadly drug they call ICE in tropical Hawaii, Bruce Hall on Jim Baker, pale, shaky, and on trial again. And Susan Spencer on a new medical finding that Mother knew already. South Africans went to the polls today to choose a new parliament while black South Africans went on strike and rioted to protest their exclusion from the vote. Tonight, South African television said its computer analysis indicated the ruling National Party would probably hold on to power, but with a substantially reduced majority. Richard Wagner is on the scene. As National Party leader F.W. de Klerk, the man generally believed to be winning this nation's presidency today, was casting his ballot, his disenfranchised opposition was casting its votes in South Africa's streets. Violent anti-government protests broke out in Cape Town, and all over this country, millions of blacks stayed away from work to protest an election from which South Africa's 28 million black people are excluded. I'm not so interested in it because they've got nothing to do with us there. It's only the wise elections. This election, beset by violence and protest, is South Africa's most important since the National Party took control 41 years ago and then introduced the policy of apartheid. That doctrine, abhorrent to much of the world, has produced economic sanctions against South Africa and increasing isolation from the rest of the international community. There is some hope here that F.W. de Klerk, a self-professed reformist, might introduce changes, but many political observers doubt that this country's ruling white establishment is about to welcome South Africa's black majority into its ranks anytime soon. We're going into a period of uh, extreme political uncertainty. Uh, before we actually get to that step. So I would think certainly by the year 2000, I would hope before, but I don't think we should think that it'll be before then. So South Africa's disenfranchised majority makes itself heard the only way it can. And the government here, acting under emergency regulations it has imposed, crushes the protests. The question is, how long can a minority repress a majority seeking full participation in the life of its country? Richard Wagner, CBS News, Johannesburg.
Citing new threats and deteriorating security, the United States today pulled the last of its diplomats out of Lebanon. Ambassador John McCarthy and 30 staff members left the embassy annex in Christian East Beirut. The building has been surrounded by demonstrators allied with Christian military leader Michel Aoun. He blames President Bush for caving into Syria, not helping the Christians in their fight against Syrian occupation troops. The Red Cross in Hungary says about 30 East German refugees got tired of waiting and dashed across the Austrian border during the night, making the break to the West on their own. Thousands more are still in refugee camps in Hungary, waiting for governments to work out an arrangement to let them go. As Anthony Mason reports, the delay has not weakened their determination. Another trailer pulled up outside the refugee camp in Budapest this morning, but this one belonged to the East German government. The relief workers would not allow the diplomats into the camp. No, no, never, never, we not. So they set up their portable consulate just outside the gate. The head officer, Dieter Grauman, said he only wanted to help those East Germans who might change their minds about going home. 5,000 refugees are waiting in Hungarian camps for permission to go west, but the consul would not admit that the East German government faces a crisis. No big problem, not such an important problem as uh, it seems to be, uh, if I say so, many journalists. Mm -hmm. But when Mr. Grauman handed out leaflets yesterday telling East Germans they would not be prosecuted if they returned, his promises quickly went up in smoke. The West German ambassador was allowed into the camp today, but left without comment. And a deal between the two Germanies that would allow the refugees to emigrate is said to be weeks away. With the question of a departure date still clouded in uncertainty, relief workers decided the refugees were in need of a distraction. We have organized a trip to the zoo. About a hundred children and their parents took the bus ride through Budapest to spend an afternoon with the animals. But many weren't impressed. We don't want to go to the zoo, one said. We want to go to the west. No one was asking to go east. The East German consul waited in his trailer and waited some more. As he sat alone, a mother and her four daughters became the newest refugees, arriving by taxi from the train station. I'm leaving East Germany, the woman said. I want my children to have a future. Anthony Mason, CBS News, Budapest. President Bush has invited trade officials from China to come to Washington for consultations, a move that reportedly surprised and pleased the Chinese and outraged some in the U.S. who oppose renewing business ties with the hardline communist government. The U.S. Navy report on the gun turret explosion that killed 47 aboard the battleship Iowa last April is officially due out tomorrow. It reportedly concludes that the most probable cause is that gunner's mate Clayton Hartwig, one of those who died in the blast, set it off deliberately, what the Navy report calls, quote, intentional human intervention. Sources told Pentagon correspondent David Martin the Navy decided not to call it a suicide because there were so many other casualties it could also be called murder. Hartwick's family is expected to contest the Navy's finding. After today, in the public unraveling of the PTL television ministry, the question was whether Jim Baker, who suffered an apparent mental collapse last week, was competent to continue with his trial on conspiracy and fraud charges. Bruce Hall reports. A pale, disheveled Jim Baker, still in handcuffs and leg irons, returned to the federal courthouse after spending nearly a week in a government psychiatric hospital for evaluation. Inside the courtroom, the hospital's chief psychiatrist said Baker was not mentally ill, but had suffered a panic attack last week, brought on by extreme anxiety and stress. She said tests revealed the television evangelist has a mild personality disorder, but is competent to stand trial. Baker spent most of the two-hour hearing slumped in his chair, his head cradled in his hand. He spoke only when Judge Robert Potter asked if he had recovered sufficiently to assist his attorneys. Baker replied, yes, sir. I am very tired, but I do believe that I can. When court recessed, Baker turned to his wife, Tammy, and said, everybody thought I was crazy, except for the doctors at the insane asylum. Outside the courthouse, relatives insisted Baker had not faked the panic attack and was still showing signs of fatigue. He just looked tired. I mean, he just looked tired. I thought, you know, I just think it's been a long ordeal. Tammy Baker, who yesterday said her husband had been manhandled in custody, today said she was relieved he was out of the hospital. 
but refused to talk about his condition. I'm too hungry, guys. How do you feel, Mr. Baker? I'm glad to be out of where I was. With Baker now back in court, the federal psychiatrist warned his attorneys they need to shield Baker from the stress and publicity surrounding this case. If not, she said Baker could once again suffer another panic attack, again disrupting this trial. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Charlotte. An eminent New York surgeon now says the warning signs he said he saw in the fingers of A. Bartlett Giamatti belong to another hand. Dr. William G. Cahan was watching a baseball game on television in late August when the camera cut to the baseball commissioner who was attending the game. Cahan thought he saw danger signs in the fingers of Giamatti, who smoked cigarettes heavily. The doctor got a warning to Giamatti just one day before Giamatti died last Friday, but the doctor now says the hand in question belonged to a fan sitting behind the commissioner. The world's most prolific best-selling author, George Simenon, has died in Switzerland. He was 86. Simenon was born in Belgium, moved to Paris in the 1920s, and began churning out novels, more than 200 in all, including 80 mysteries, including his mild-mannered detective, Inspector McGray. His books have sold more than 500 million copies. <laughs>